Uh, thank you very much, Ginger. I hope you can see the slide. Yes. Okay, so um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, uh, Professor Spence and uh, Dr. Bagla for the excellent uh, presentation. I appreciate very much Long for inviting me to be the discussant. I'm obviously not qualified to discuss uh, the, on this topic, but let, I will try my best to, uh, uh, to do my job. But, uh, let me start out by saying that I cannot agree more with everything both speakers mentioned. In my presentation, I will basically uh, put, uh, first put together uh, maybe a conceptual framework to think about how you know, inequality emerge and how technology uh, can you know, affect uh, the inequality. Okay, so I um, would think of the you know, three basic sources of inequality, pre-market, market, and post-market. And pre-market, you can think about, you know, you know, we are born into different families with different endowments, and uh, our uh, skills will be you know, affected by opportunities to educate, education and training. And uh, ultimately, we'll enter the, the market with pre-market uh, with the skills. And these skill, uh, skills are financial resources. And these are factors in the labor market that will, affect, you know, will fetch factor prices that will determine the income we receive. And uh, the, the factor prices, of course, is going to be shaped very much by technology and globalization, as Professor Spence mentioned. Right? So the factors uh, include labor skills, both entrepreneurial and managerial skills, land and natural resources, capital, we mentioned, uh, uh, mentioned you know, labor enhancing capital or labor substituting capital as more and more AI autonomous machines are you know, coming online. Of course, ideas and technology. All these factors, how, what will the, be the price for of these factors will be affected by how big the market size could be, right? And the market size obviously is, is gonna be affected by both technology and globalization, I will illustrate in the next picture, the internet, for example, really accelerated the size of the market an idea or product can, can reach. But more than that, right, it's also the, the availability of data allowed us to produce goods that are more personalized, that the market expanded not just because it can reach more people because of the internet, but also goods that are more personalized, that suits consumers' needs better, can be produced because of the available uh, uh, in the data and the technology. And also, uh, Professor Spence mentioned the financial market finance plays an important role in affecting the factor prices, the ability to finance and scale up the startups, all these you know, uh, 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 ideas that can quickly turn into a big uh, company. This re requires financial development. And of course, the ability of financial development, uh, the financial development is very much affected by technology and globalization, and I'll illustrate that uh, a little later as well. And as I said, market determines factor prices, uh, you know, with, and the factor prices affected by the production technology uh, that's prevailing in the market, as well as laws and regulations and so on that uh, policymakers can obviously play a, an important role. And that market, you know, uh, uh, generates some, degree, some type of income distribution that we may or may not like, but there are post-market interventions that can change it, right? So post-market uh, uh, redistribution in the form of taxes and transfers, social insurance, safety net, and a charity. And then finally, we will result, we'll uh, observe for a given you know, uh, time horizon, we're thinking about a year or, or, or a decade, whatever, some distribution of income, consumption, health, leisure, and well-being. And this uh, uh, um, um, uh, income distribution will through um, dynamics uh, result in some wealth and income, wealth inequality, uh, wealth distribution and wealth inequality. And then there are roles to, uh, to play in terms of uh, uh, this uh, wealth distribution uh, will affect the pre-market inequality that, uh, that uh, uh, we see here. This arrow kind of represents how family backgrounds affect pre-market uh, you know, uh, endowment as well as skill investment opportunities. And this framework, I think, also kind of illustrates how if we are concerned about, you know, if we do not like the uh, dis resulting distribution of, uh, of income from the market, uh, we can think about in, um, uh, interventions in three places, like pre-market policies, right? To ensure, for example, education access, equalization of school quality, education finance to alleviate credit constraints as well. And here, I would say that technology can play an important role, right? 
So uh, for example, equalizing school, uh, equalization of school quality can be um, um, uh, made, it e made easier by technology, right? So the, you know, the best teachers that, are, that were previously unaccessible by a, uh, by a student in rural area, their lectures can now be broadcasted or be, be, be even broadcasted live even uh, and accessed by uh, students in living in remote areas. Similar, similar with financing, right? So education financing is always a, a problem because human capital cannot be used as collateral, but with the development in technology, there are abilities to, uh, to, to, you know, uh, uh, to provide trust um, and use data as collateral um, to uh, alleviate the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the credit constraints in education financing market, right? So ultimately in the pre-market inter intervention, would, would you know the goal is to equalize opportunities, and which, as Eric mentioned, right, is is not necessary in um, uh, in contradiction with uh, efficiency because equality of opportunity in terms of education access will allow our society to tap the previously untapped talents. Right, there are a lot of talents that were wasted away because they did not have opportunity to develop the skills and contribute to the labor market. Right, so that's one area, the pre-market intervention. In the market, of course, you know, there is regulation and laws that can affect uh, the factor prices. Here, I would emphasize that the important thing for the mar uh, within market intervention is to, um, to, you know, to, to, pro, uh, to enhance competition. And finally, uh, the tax and transfer and the charity are always these policies that can, uh, can uh, post-market can alleviate inequalities. So let me just quickly go through, uh, illustrate a few of the ideas, uh, you know, uh, provide some details of of that conceptual framework. This was a picture about the active internet users um, and, and mobile users, et cetera, in the world, right? In the digital era, these are all potential consumers of a, of a killer product, right? That was unimaginable before the digital age. And as, as I mentioned, the market access is uh, for, uh, for companies, the big companies uh, that emerged in the last 20 years is really growing at a speed that was unheard of in the, in the, uh, in the previous decades. As I mentioned, the technology also allows further market access by, by tapping consumers who, who, in economics language, who previously would not have purchased the product because the product was, uh, was not uh, tailor-made for them. And data availability and personalized production become more prevalent uh, as technology uh, allows, and that allows more consumers, not just and not just low numbers, as I show you this picture, more, 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 more users uh, can actually become real consumers because the product can suit their needs. And this is a measure of global, uh, globalization as uh, um, uh, summarized by, you know, by uh, the flows of goods and flows of uh, money, flows of information and the flows of people across the country borders. And you can see that you know, from uh, 1990, the world has been more globalized despite the recent you know, kind of uh, 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 protest or, or, or a downward uh, decline in globalization. But nonetheless, the world is more connected, uh, more, more connected place than, than, uh, than uh, ever before. Um, so globalization allow the market and ideas and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, uh, companies to scale up a lot faster, both because it involves flows of money, goods, information, and people, okay? And last thing I want to say about technology, how technology may change the, uh, um, you know, the market factor prices that ultimately determines uh, the inequality is that market technology institutions jointly determine the architecture of trust. And, uh, and uh, we know that borrowing lending, which is an important part of finance, and borrowing and buying and selling, which is an important part of marketing, both require trust, especially you know, among uh, strangers, right? So, uh, Mike's co colleague, Arun uh, Sandrajan at NYU once said, if we look back at history, every time there's a big expansion of economic activity is generally induced by the creation of new forms of trust. And the human society did have an evolution of how trust is being uh, 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 built, right? So early human society relies on peer-to-peer -peer trust, um, per, you know, family members, relatives, and people of the same ethnic group and so on. The, the problem of it is that it has a relatively small radius. So economic activity typically is constrained by how far the trust can, can, can radiate. And uh, you know, some groups that are, are somehow scattered around the world, they actually specialize in 
in commerce, in finance, precisely because they have a broader peer-to-peer -peer trust network. And that peer-to-peer -peer trust network, a trust, eventually is being replaced by institutional trust, right? Relying on the state or some other powerful central authority to pass laws and involve dis resolve disputes and enforce contracts. Uh, contracts. The problem of this institutional trust system is limited by the incompleteness of contracts. Not everything can be described in words in a contract and being enforced by the, by the court. And at this stage, uh, you know, Alibaba, or, uh, for example, you know, is building something called intermediary trust. E-commerce platforms is an intermediary that provides trust to the buyers and sellers who do not know each other, who might have never met each other, and they nonetheless trust each other because of the intermediary. And uh, uh, before the pandemic, in March of 2019, Long organized a very nice conference in person in Hangzhou uh, about digital governance, and I was uh, I, I participated in that conference where um, um, I, I, I basically said that uh, the biggest uh, contribution of Alibaba to the Chinese economy is to build a trust system, to really uh, uh, build a, a, a new trust system and allow the commerce to expand. And of course, now we, are, yeah, we, we are now talking about blockchains and this is of course there's uncertainty, but the biggest potential blockchain is that we may have a new, completely new architecture for trust, in code we trust. If that were to uh, be realized, we are gonna be seeing much bigger expansions of commerce and affecting prices of factors, of course. So uh, last minute, I would just mention that, you know, a poverty reduction and inequality can, uh, technology can both reduce poverty and at the same time increase inequality because they are two very different statistics. Um, uh, and I'm gonna skip that and this was the, the Taobao Village study that uh, Eric mentioned on the left-hand side is the, the, the Vox China uh, 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 summary article about, about this study. Uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, one of the co-founders of Vox China, so this is a little bit of shameless advertisement. I, uh, I hope you'll uh, pay attention to it. Um, but uh, uh, at the same time, digital economy may increase inequality because digital platforms enjoy important networks, thick market externality, you know, large uh, online retailers can negotiate better procurement prices, and they have more data about their, uh, and, uh, about their customers that can allow them to, to have a competitive ad advantage relative to other competitors. So the policy remedy, I say, is not to ban data or platform, but to leverage the playing field between large platforms and small and medium enterprises by ensuring mutual access to data and the platform infrastructure and to, to ensure that efficiency gains from e-commerce are broadly shared among vendors on the platform. I think competition policy will be an important, important tool in, you know, at the same time, if enjoy the efficiency gained from big platforms, but also uh, you know, uh, uh, broadly share the efficiency gains. Uh, and uh, um, uh, this is the point I want to echo with uh, Professor Spence. Um, the, so the, the, there will be inequality in whatever um, you know, um, uh, mechanism uh, uh, we organize our economy. And whether these natural distributions of inequality is acceptable or not uh, is a collective decision because large inequalities will have consequences that are both social, political, economic, and moral. And it's ultimately social acceptable inequalities are political outcome through protests, elections, reforms, and revolutions, or threats of a revolution. And finally, just let me uh, 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 end with this slide. Uh, we should think about pre-market policies, market regulations, social safety net right, interventions in the pre-market market, and post-market. The goal is to ensure inequality is more transitory than permanent and to promote intergenerational mobility. So I'll stop here, thank you.